Well, good morning, Camelback Bible Church. It's good to see you awake and alive this morning. Well, we're gathered here this morning as the body of Christ to worship Christ, our head, and to hear from his word and to worship our risen king. My name is Bijan Maluji. I am the pastor of students here at Camelback Bible Church, if you're unfamiliar with me. Uh, and if you're visiting this morning, we wanted to get the opportunity to meet you and greet you and welcome you to our church. And one of the ways that we try to connect with people is we ask we, that you take out your phone and you text Welcome CBC to 94000. You'll get a link back with a connect card in which you can fill out some information and myself or one of the other pastors will be sure to give you a call and reach out to you and help get you plugged in and make you feel welcome here. Once again, that's uh, Welcome CBC to 94000. If you want to find the verbiage for that, that'll be on the back of your order of service here in case you want to do that a little bit later. Well, we do have a few announcements for you this morning. Our first is uh, we are going to be starting a marriage community group. We want to make an investment in our marriages here at Camelback Bible Church because marriage is a picture of the gospel. So we want to make sure that our marriages are strong, Christ-centered, and, and shows the gospel to the world. And um, Eric and Megan Holm are going to be hosting this marriage community group on a starting on April 1st. They're going to be going through a video study series of Paul David Tripp, um, and it's going to be very practical, very helpful. Uh, so if you if that's something that you are interested in, make sure you contact them and see if you can uh, get get their address and get to their place on April 1st. And that community group is actually open to anyone, whether married or not. So the truths of marriage are not just for the married, it's for all of us. So if you're interested in that, again, make sure to contact Eric and Megan Holm. Well, we also want to remind you about our new Teleos series starting up this Wednesday, taught by Kirk Heisinga. It's going to be Understanding Your Identity from Ephesians 1 through 3. So this class is also open to anyone. If you would like some more information about that, you can look on the church app or get some more info in the, at the info desk in the Mac. Uh, we also want to continue to offer a call for help and service. Uh, as I mentioned last week, Easter is on the horizon and we want to be prepared to receive many visitors well and greet them with the love and the warmth of Christ. Uh, that said, we still need hospitality folks who will help us do that to receive them well and to make this vision come to life. So if you are interested in doing this, make sure you contact Pastor Luke. He's gathering this team together. That way we can be well prepared for the many people who don't know Christ but often come to Easter and Christmas services. Uh, speaking of Easter, there was uh, there is a young adults community group that we started just last fall, and this young adult community group is going to be making Easter baskets for foster kids, just like we have been making uh, Christmas baskets during Christmas time. This community group has decided to make Easter baskets, and they're doing this in partnership with Christian Family Care. And the reason that we are partnering with them is because one of our own people who is involved in that community group works for them. Her name is Caitlin Thropay. Um, so they're going to be putting these baskets together, but they do need materials. If you want to help support uh, the other members in this body doing a good work, please bring items to donate. There's a sheet that uh, lists all the items that are donated for different grades and ages. That's at the info desk. And then you can drop off items at the info desk as well. They're going to be collecting items through March 20th. So that is a tangible way to use our, our, our treasure for uh, the glory of God and for the good of our community. Well, as I think about just the last week, we had such a great turnout for our dive into doctrine as well as our wacky Olympics. Um, and it caused us to think and, and reflect on the fact that good teaching and good teachers are a blessing and a gift to the church. And we want to develop a culture of encouragement and appreciation. So in light of that, we want to take this time this morning to recognize specifically our Teleos teachers. We, have, we appreciate all of our teachers from the women's ministry to the kids' ministry, but we want to show appreciation for them this morning who work hard and give their time so that we may know God through his word more clearly, deeply, and intimately. So I'm going to list some names, and if you're here this morning, would you mind standing up? We have Kirk and Laura Heisinga, Marlene Delnos, Tom Blanchard, Steve Lobby, Gaylord Moore, Megan Holm, Becky Jones, Megan Lehman, Leslie Blakely, Marilyn Hayes, 
and Carol White. So if you wouldn't mind standing up if you're here, and we just want to say we are grateful for each of you and receive you as a gift. Yes, but please go. We receive you as a gift to our church. We thank you for all of your work. So thank you guys. We, we receive you as the gift that you are. Well, body, let's stand and hear God call us to worship from his word this morning in Psalm 63. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. Wonderful. Let's sing to the Lord from Him at 295 this morning. church, what do you believe about God? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. 
From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God, our God, the only true God. We were dead in our trespasses and sins in which we once walked. And we followed the course of this world. We followed the prince of the power of the air the spirit that is still now at work in the sons and daughters of disobedience, but among whom we all once lived. We followed the passions of our flesh. We carried out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But, O oh, our God, you are rich in mercy. And because of the great love with which you loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, you made us alive together with Christ. By grace, your grace, we have been saved. And you have raised us up with him, with Christ, and seated us with him in the heavenly places so that in the coming ages you might show us the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us. For it is by your grace that we have been saved, our Lord, through faith. And this is not our doing. It is your gift to us not as a result of our works. We have nothing to boast, but we are your creation, your workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that you prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we come before you, our Lord, humbly this morning, asking you to forgive us from our sins, to cleanse us from unrighteousness, and to lead us as we walk in your will. This we do through the name and power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now hear from Galatians 2. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is God's promise to us. Yes, Would you please stand and sing hymn 455? And children, if you could stay with us for the singing of the hymn, and then you'll be dismissed after that.
my chains fell off, my heart was free. We've just sung the gospel to each other. So now let's take a minute and greet the people that are around you. Um, if you're regular here at Camelback, you are the greeting committee. So make sure if someone is new that they feel welcome and invite them to your community group. And children are dismissed. All right, let's come back together. I smile because if you're an extrovert, this time is too short. If you're an introvert, this time is too long. And uh, somehow it balances out. But it's important for us as a body uh, to, um, to greet each other. One of the things that we're doing when we gather together as God's people is we're uh, pointing each other to reality, what really is true so that we don't live a fiction and that we don't believe lies, but we gather with other people in the body of Christ and remind ourselves that this really is what the world is about, that Jesus really is on the throne. And we need each other to be able to do that. So uh, it's so good to be able to connect. God has given us each other in relationships as, as friends and brothers and sisters. Well, together as the family of God, let's go to prayer. Lord, we thank you that we can trust you with our lives. The psalmist says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise, against me, yet will I be confident. Lord, we can trust you with our lives, and we ask you to take away our fear. Lord, we trust you with our personal lives. We bring to you the things that are on our hearts, the cares and the concerns. Lord, your word says that each heart knows its own bitterness. Nobody else, no matter how close, knows the true and deep concerns that we have. And we bring those to you. And we ask that you would take away our fear. We trust you with the life of our church We think about our children who are now off in Sunday morning discipleship, and we ask that you would save them, open their eyes to see Jesus. We trust you with the teaching ministry of the church, and we're so thankful that we can recognize and thank those who work teaching adults this morning. We trust you, Lord, with the relationships and the fellowship of our church, with our local outreach. We put all these things into your hand. We trust you with the life of Cadillac Bible Church. And Lord, we trust you with our world. Particularly, we think of Ukraine. So often when we read those words from a minute ago, 
from Psalm 27, though war arise against me, yet will I be confident. We think of that figuratively, but Lord, that is happening really now. We've been horrified by what we see. So Lord, we pray for an end to the violence. We pray that you would comfort the grieving. We pray that you would heal the wounded. We pray that you would provide for refugees. We pray that you would wrap your arms around the children that are caught up in something so much bigger and beyond them, seemingly helpless and vulnerable. Will you be their God? And Lord, we pray for leaders in Moscow and Kyiv and in other capitals of the world, particularly for Presidents Putin and Zelensky. We pray, Lord, that you would um, bring peace and give them wisdom and that you would uh, work in their hearts to bring an end to all of this. We pray for all those who are suffering today because of the horrors that we are witnessing in Ukraine. And we pray particularly for the church. We pray for the church in Ukraine, especially our missionaries, Doug and Marina Landro, who are welcoming refugees in Western Ukraine. We thank you that they're safe, but we pray that you would give them endurance and strength and love as they are the hands and feet of Christ. Pray for other brothers and sisters around that great country. And for those in Russia. And we pray, Lord, that the church would stand above national affiliations for the kingdom of God and for your plans and your purposes in this world. And we pray that you would lead us to know how we can be part of serving you in this great moment. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's continue on in prayer with the prayer that our Lord taught his disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, choir, thank you for that beautiful Ukrainian hallelujah that was really moving. Uh, we decided to include that little note about how this was written and the significance of it so that we would all be able to think about what is happening in that part of the world, particularly with our brothers and sisters. And so others, many have asked about Doug Landry, our missionary who was just here a few months ago that we interviewed. And uh, he's safe. They're, they're in Western Ukraine. Uh, their church is taking in refugees. And um, they're saying that it's about $500 a day for them to be able to feed and house and clothe the people that God is bringing them. And so many people have asked how they can help. Uh, we're going to be sending out a link today. We sent out on Sunday afternoons a link that has uh, uh, an email that has a link to the services um, so that you can watch online if you, if you weren't here. Um, and so we'll be including that link in the Sunday email as well as on Wednesday. And um, if you... Uh, you can also call the church office and get that link, and we'll be happy to send that to you. We just didn't have time by the time we found the link to get it printed in the bulletins because these get printed on Thursdays. So that's, uh, that's how we're sending it out this way. But if you want to join hands with the Landros and their church in the Ukraine, you can do that that way. We're also uh, supporting the ministry, the gospel ministry here at Camelback. And we are bringing the good news of Jesus Christ in our community and helping believers grow together. And so if you brought a gift uh, to give today, you can put it in the box that's on the back wall of the church. Uh, many of us are giving online. Um, you can also text give CBC to 94,000. That information is on the back page of, the, uh, of your order of service today. And as we have this time of offertory, now let's think about how we are giving ourselves to the Lord and using our resources for his kingdom. Everything that we have, all that we are, is for him and his glory. I will be reading out of the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. 
It's found on page 984 in the Black Bible in the pew in front of you. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Thank you, Carmen. Keep your Bibles open to Colossians chapter one of uh, chapter three, of course. Well, a couple weeks ago, I needed to replace the cabin air filter on our minivan, and uh, I decided I didn't want to pay the repair shop to do it. I can just do that myself, but I wasn't quite sure how to go about it, so I looked it up on YouTube. And sure enough, there was a guy with a 2011 Toyota Sienna, my exact model year, who walked me through the process. And it really is amazing what you can find on YouTube. You can find instructions on how to bake an apple pie, how to apply eyeliner, (laughs) investing for retirement, dog training, and the list goes on and on and on. Sometimes it's really helpful to have someone who shows you what to do. And this is a good way to think about Colossians chapter 3, because the Apostle Paul is showing us how to live the Christian life. He walks us through the process. And we can see how this fits in with the flow of the letter. You'll remember that chapter 2, verse 6 is the central verse. If you look back across the page with me at 2, 6, this is, you can think of this as the hinge of the book of Colossians. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Up to that point, he's talked about that they have received Christ Jesus the Lord and what that means and how it happened. And from that point on, he talks about how to walk in him. The rest of chapter 2 has warnings. Don't be held captive. Don't fall for counterfeits. And now positively in chapter 3, he shows us how to live the Christian life. How to walk in him. How to live as people who are alive in Christ. We've passed from death to life. The scriptures say if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. New creation. God is restoring this broken world. He's begun a new creation. A new age began with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when you turn to Christ and trust in him, you begin living in this new age. You become part of that new creation. It's already started, and it's going to come to full flower at the end of time when God restores everything in this world. But he's begun it now with you. You're in Christ. You're alive. You're a new creation. How should you live? That's what chapter 3 is about. And as he starts off in verses 1 through 4, he begins with an introduction of how we do that. How do we walk in Christ? How do we live as Christians, as people who are truly alive? And he gives us one condition and two commands and three reasons. How do you walk in Christ? How do you live the Christian life? One command, one condition, two commands, and three reasons. And this is a starting place for all that he has to say in this rich chapter. 
So one condition, that's what he starts with. If then you have been raised with Christ. If you've been raised with Christ, or since you've been raised with Christ. He's talking about genuine conversion, a spiritual transformation. This isn't something that's optional. It's necessary. A few weeks ago, I was in Texas, and uh, there was a big snowstorm that came through. And uh, I pulled out the owner's manual of the car that I, was, uh, that I was renting, and it said something along the lines of, if you have the optional traction control system, dot, dot, dot. Some cars have it, some cars don't. He's not talking about something that's optional here. He's talking about something that's necessary. It's not for some Christians, but not for others. It's for every Christian. We have to start by being raised with Christ if you want to live the Christian life. That's why Jesus says, you must be born again. You must be born again. The danger is you can actually learn how to behave like a Christian without actually being a Christian. You can get socialized into Christian community and learn how to show up at the right time with the right book and say the right things. And no one knows. You can pass as a follower of Jesus and even write a personal testimony. We teach our kids how to do that. Even if you're not truly saved. This is a particular danger if you've grown up in church. You can fool others and even fool yourself. But if you haven't been raised with Christ, like he says here, you are not saved and you can't experience the Christian life. This is a necessary condition. So what does it mean to be raised with Christ? Paul is talking about a spiritual resurrection. You need to be made alive spiritually. We all start off dead in our sins. Physically, we're alive on the outside. We move and eat and drink and do all sorts of things. But inside, we're dead. We don't know God, we don't want to obey God, we don't love God, we hide from God as our judge, we are dead. We can't say no to sin. It's our very nature, and so we do sin all the time, and we don't even feel bad about it, oftentimes because that's our hearts. But God gives spiritual life through Christ to people who are dead spiritually. Look back across the page at chapter 2, verse 13. Paul's already talked about that. He says, and you, this is 2.13, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses, our sins, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. What did God do? Jesus carried the sins of his people on the cross. He had no sin of his own to die for. His death paid the debt that we owed, so our sins were nailed to the cross in him. And that means that you and I can be completely forgiven. How? How can we be forgiven? By trusting in Jesus' death and resurrection. 
by seeing and understanding and believing that he died for sinners like you and me and rose again to give us life. This is what the Bible calls faith. We put our confidence in what he did. We see that God raised Jesus and we trust him to take away our sins. If you look back across the page again in verse 12, he talks a little bit about more about what this means. Chapter 2, verse 12. He says, you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him, that is Jesus, from the dead. When you trust in what God has done for us by, uh, by raising Jesus from the dead, you are saved and you are made alive. We have a picture of this in baptism. When you see somebody baptized, what happens? They go down into the water and they come back up. That's not just a random action, but it's a picture of what's happened when we're saved. We are lying down, the water closes over us. A picture of lying down in the grave, joining Jesus in his death, and then we are brought up out of the water, raised with Christ, raised to new life. It's a picture of salvation. So the question for us as we think about this one condition is have I been raised with Christ? Have you been made alive with him? Or have you learned how to behave as a Christian? Maybe you thought Christianity was all about being a moral person, a good person, a good neighbor, and if for the first time you're understanding, wait a second, there's more to it. I actually need to admit that I'm a sinner and put my faith in Jesus' death and resurrection. Have you been born again? If not, then you need to do that now. Now is a great time to turn to him. You can pray in your heart at this moment. It doesn't have to be loud or anything weird. You just in your heart say, Lord, I, I realize now that I'm a sinner. And I see that Jesus gave his life for me on the cross and carried my sin. I'm trusting in that. That you raised him from the dead so that I could have life too. You can do that in your heart. Turn and follow him now. And if that's something that you're doing in your heart this morning, I want you to come up and talk to me afterwards so that I can pray with you and we can talk about what the next steps are for you as a Christian. This is the one great condition, spiritual life. Have you been raised with Christ? Paul doesn't start with what to do and a set of rules and morality. He starts with who you are. Are you alive in Christ? And then he comes to two commands. One condition, two commands. And the first command is to seek. Seek the things that are above, he says, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Seek. This has to do with our motivations, what we're living for. He's not talking about hide and seek as if the things that are above are hiding and you have to go searching behind bushes for them. It's not like looking for lost keys. It's not like seeking the solution to a math problem or a riddle. But this is about wanting and desiring and striving. It has to do with my heart's longing. What drives me, what I want in the deepest part of who I am. What drives me? And this calls up a rich Old Testament background of seeking God. Isaiah 55, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. 
Psalm 27, one thing I have asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Psalm 105, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. This isn't a casual search. This sort of seeking isn't like, where did I put my slippers? I can't find them today. It's the driving force of my life. What do I really want? This becomes clearer when we notice what we seek, the things above. And the things above aren't just the furniture of heaven, streets of gold and mansions and rewards, but the things above center on Christ. It's defined by Jesus himself. Seek the things that are above where Christ is. That's what defines where we seek. It's Jesus himself, where he is. We want to be with him. He promised, where I am, you also will be. That's what we want if we're disciples. That's what we seek. We seek not only Jesus himself, but we also see his rule and his authority. He is seated at the right hand of God. So seeking the things that are above is a focus on Christ, the great ruler of the universe. We want him more than anything else. We want our savior. In fact, heaven wouldn't be heaven if Christ wasn't there. We long for heaven because we long for him. Try this little thought experiment with me. If you died and you could have everything you dreamed of in heaven, your body would be healed, you wouldn't need glasses anymore, that problem part of your body that you don't like would be different. Everybody that you love is there, creation is completely renewed, All your disappointments are wiped away. No more sorrows, no more worries, no more pain. Everything, everything that you want is there. Except Jesus isn't there. Would that satisfy you? Would you think that you were in the good place? Would you be happy? Heaven isn't heaven without Jesus. Seek the things that are above where Christ is. If you're a Christian, the driving desire of your heart, the thing that motivates you, what you want most out of life and eternity is to be with him. He's in heaven, and that's why I want to be there. It's not the streets of gold. It's him. This was hammered home to me a few years ago. My uh, nephew and his wife, this was really tragic. They, they lost a full-term baby just a couple days before the due date. I mean, this, this was really hard for our family. She had to deliver this unborn child. It was, it was horrible. And so we gathered at the hospital, and um, I was driving my mom from the hospital afterwards where she had just seen her stillborn grandson. And I said, Mom, Think of all the people that are there to greet little Arthur. He was named after my dad, his grandfather. Think of everyone who's heaven, who is in heaven to meet him. Dad's there. Mom, your parents are there. Your aunts and uncles, your grandparents who love Jesus, they're there to welcome this little baby into their arms. And 
my mom just stopped and looked at me and said, yeah, that's true. But the best thing is Jesus is there. And Jesus welcomes them. I'll never forget that. We seek the things that are above where Christ is. That's what we want. That's what burns in our souls. That's what we love. So how do we do that? How do you grow your love for Christ that you're seeking him? Well, if you're seeking him, you want to know more about him. If I'm saving up for a purchase, maybe it's a new car or something like that, I get more and more excited the more I learn about this new car. Oh, wow. Look at how the steering system works. Oh, wow, look at the gas mileage it gets. And so I'll geek out, and I'll start finding out more and more about this car. And the more I find out about it, the more excited I am until I buy it. The more and more you learn about Jesus, the more and more you focus on him, the more excited you're going to be, the more you're going to be seeking the things that are in heaven. You want to learn more about him by reading his word. You have to be reading the Bible and praying to him, speaking to him. Serving him. Learning. Serve his people. You're sitting with the body of Christ. If you want to be in line with Jesus' heart, serve the people that are around you. And as you do, you'll find that his heart, his love is moving through you. And your love for him will grow. Invest in him and in his work. Jesus said, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So put your treasure there. Put your treasure in his work, and you'll find that your heart is naturally drawn there too. Seek the things that are above where Christ is. That's his second command. That's his first command. His second command is to set Seek and set. Seek and set. Very easy in the text. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. If seeking had to do with your motivation, this has to do with your mentality, how you think. What guides your thinking? How are you setting your mind? A few years ago, I was teaching Andrew how to mow the yard and we don't want lines, of course, going like this all across the yard. You want nice straight lines. The problem is if you're looking down at the mower as you go, you're going to wander like that. So I shared the trick that someone taught me. Don't focus right in front of you. Pick a spot on the other side of the yard and walk toward that. And your line will be straight all the way across the yard. It's the same thing with setting your mind. If my thinking is focused on things that are on earth, if I'm looking down, then my life is going to veer here and there. And I'll look back and I'll say, wait, I thought I was straight, but look at how I've gone back and forth. I need to keep my eyes on the things that are above and let that guide my thinking. So I need to keep my eyes on the reality that's plain to see in heaven. I'm looking there, and that's going to shape the way I think about this world. Jesus really is sitting at God's right hand. He does have all power and authority. He is coming to judge the living and the dead. I have been raised with Christ. I am a new creation. God is restoring the world through Christ. A new age has begun, and that's what I focus on, and my life then tracks in that direction. I think about things the right way. The most rational thing you could possibly do is to think and plan and live based on these truths. That's sanity. It's living in reality. 
One of the reasons that we gather together as believers every Sunday is to help us think about reality once again and to move away from the fiction of the world to the truth. We don't think about life the same way. We think differently about success. It's no longer about acquiring and status and where you belong and what you wear. Jesus said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Success looks differently. I'm here to serve. And success is hearing Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. We think differently about pain and suffering. When you're in the middle of it, it can just completely fill your horizons and there's no hope. You can't see beyond it. And you think life is terrible. Why am I going through this? What good is there in being a Christian? But if we set our minds on things above, not on things that are on earth, we think about even our suffering and our pain and our sorrows and our disappointment and our grief and our tears differently. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. We think differently about pain and suffering. And we think about the church differently. This isn't just a gathering of people who share a common interest, as if it was like, you know, people who are into like model airplanes or something who get together at the community center once a month. That's not what this is. This is a gathering of the people of God who have been made a new creation, who are going to spend eternity together, and who are going to reign with Christ. The church is very different if your mind is set on things above. So two commands. Seek the things that are above. What's motivating you? Set your mind on things above. How are you thinking about life? One condition, two commands, and now three reasons. And you can see them in verses three and four of the text. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Three reasons to seek and set your mind on things above, and it's based on the past and the present and the future. Do you see the past and present and future here? Past, for you have died. Not physically, of course. He's writing to believers in Colossae who were going to have this letter read. They were very much alive physically. But if you're a Christian, you died to this world when you were saved. We're joined to Jesus in his death and resurrection. When the world rejected Christ, it rejected you. When the world killed Christ, you died with him. Your old life is over. You don't belong here anymore for you have died. You have something much greater now. The second reason, in the present, your life is hidden with Christ in God. This means that you are hidden from the world. The world didn't recognize Jesus and it doesn't recognize you either. The life you have the glory that you have as a child of God is hidden in this world. At the beginning of 1 Peter, uh, the Apostle Peter has, I think, just a great summary of who we are as Christians. He calls us elect exiles. Elect exiles. There is a cognitive dissonance in those two words that summarizes the reality of being a Christian. You're elect, you're chosen by God, you belong to him. 
And you would think that if you're elect, if you're God's chosen, then life is going to be perfect for you. Isn't that what happens to the chosen one? Everything is good. No trouble, no, no sorrow, no pains. You're elect. Yeah, but then he pairs it. You're an elect exile. And you think to yourself, well, if I'm on exile, then life isn't going the way it's supposed to be. I'm a refugee. I've been driven out of my home. Things aren't going well for me. The reality of the Christian life, in many ways, is captured by those two words put together. You're an elect exile. It's the same reality that Paul is talking about here. Your life is hidden with Christ and God. The world didn't recognize Jesus. It doesn't recognize you. It also means that you're safe from the world. If your life is hidden with Christ, you can't be separated from him. I sometimes buy used books from my library on Amazon. And as I'm opening it up and looking through and reading it, I'll come across a slip of paper that the previous owner left in his pages, and I think about what happened. This guy was writing something. He slipped it in the pages, put it up in his shelf, and then decided, oh, I'm going to sell this book. So he ships it off to Amazon, forgets the pages in there. That book gets shipped to Amazon. It goes through its warehouse with all the robots that are moving it here and there. It gets put in a package, delivered to my door. And then I open it up, and I see that little slip of paper. Where the book goes, that paper goes. What happens to the book happens to that scrap of paper. Why? Because it's hidden in the book. Your life isn't hidden in a book. You're hidden with Christ in God. Is there any safer place to be? And then the third reason, and this is looking toward the future, you are waiting for glory to come. When Christ, who is your life, appears, you also will appear with him in glory. Your life will not be hidden forever. God has set a date when Jesus will be revealed to the world and all his people with him. This is cross time. That will be crown time. The world will see Christ and the world will see you. Christ will come to rule, and you will be with him. And the stupendous reality, something we wouldn't dare say unless the Bible did, is that you and I will reign with Christ. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, do you not know that the saints, that's you and me, will judge the world? In 2 Timothy chapter 2, if we endure, we will also reign with him. Imagine that. God has planned a future for us that takes our breath away. We'll appear with Christ in his glory. And we'll reign with him. That's a reason to keep your eyes set on heaven. To have your heart seeking heaven. If you're rational and these things are true, then that's what you live for. The Christian life is not a set of rules for moral living. It's not something you can learn on YouTube. It's rooted in these astounding realities. One condition, you must be alive in Christ. Two commands, seek and set. And three reasons. You've died, you're hidden in Christ, and there's glory to come. And the table that we're about to share is a reminder of that great glory. Lord, we thank you for your word and for the great promises and truths and reality that it gives to us. And we thank you, Lord, that you have given us such strong hope and encouragement. 
And that starting from the inside out, you change us and transform us and give us life so that we can live for you. So I pray again for the person who's here this morning that doesn't yet know you. That today they'll say, yeah, I, I, I need that life. I need my sins forgiven. And that they'll turn to you. For the Christian who's here this morning, and the way is getting long. The road is hard. It's steep. They're getting tired. I pray, Lord, that as we fix our eyes on heaven where Christ is, we'll have strength to keep walking, keep working, keep serving, keep living for you. Amen. Let's stand and we'll sing the first verse of hymn 398. seated. This communion table points us forward to the great realities that we're talking about. Jesus said, I won't eat this bread or drink this cup until I drink it, until I do it again in my kingdom. And so we're looking forward to the day when we'll sit with Jesus. If you don't have one of of these uh, containers that has the little bread and the juice in it, then um, we're coming around and uh, just raise your hand and we'll make sure you have one of these. This is a meal that's for those who are made alive in Christ, who have been raised from death to life spiritually. So if you're not a Christian, we're gonna ask you to let this pass you by. The scriptures warn us not to eat and drink judgment on yourself. But if you are, this is a meal that points us to Jesus and the life that we have in him. Lord Jesus, on the night that he took bread and he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, we thank you for your body that was broken for us and that your death gave us life, that we are joined to you in your death, your physical death, a human being just like us, our representative. And this bread reminds us of that, that you shared flesh and blood with us so that you could die in our place. We thank you for that. We thank you for the hope that that gives us, that just as you were raised from the dead, so too shall we be raised physically with you, given new bodies, life with you forever. pray this in Jesus' name, amen. And after supper, Jesus took the cup, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's stand together and sing.
Before we leave, we want to recognize and commission uh, our missions team that's going on a missions trip. And so I'm gonna invite them to come forward if you're part of the missions team. And they're heading down uh, to Mexico, um, a city right near Rocky Point, where they're going to be uh, helping a local ministry uh, build housing and provide shelter as a way of building bridges for the gospel. And uh, go ahead and come up here and face the front so everybody can see you. And uh, Carly, can you give us some uh, things that we could be praying for as we think of uh, this team? And they're leaving on Friday, coming back Monday. Yes, definitely pray uh, that we would be guarded against uh, pride or judgment and that we'd be full of love and service for the people that we're going uh, to meet and that we would be sensitive to any cultural differences and that we'd be able to connect with them despite potential language barriers as well. Let's pray for these brothers and sisters as they go. Lord, we thank you so much for this team and for um, this opportunity that they have to be able to serve and open doors for the gospel uh, by using their hands. And so we pray, Lord, that as they go, that the beauty of Christ would rest on them and that uh, you would uh, keep from um, any sort of cross-cultural miscommunications or trouble or pride, but that with servants' hearts, they would go and... Uh, see and extend the love of Christ to everyone that they're working with. We pray, Lord, for safety. We pray for health. We pray for great relationships and unity on the team. And we pray that you would bring spiritual fruit, that men and women and children would come to Christ because of this extension of the love of Christ in a physical way. In your name, amen. Thanks and go with God.